Welcome, dear readers. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We're recording today from various locations around Winnipeg, all within Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Dakota, as well as the birthplace of the Métis Nation and the heart of the Métis homeland. Our drinking water comes from Shoal Lake 41st Nation in Treaty 3 territory. In this episode, we will be discussing Lovecraft Country by Matt Ruff. I'm Dennis from the Idea Mill, and I'd like some of that magical immunity, please. Across the screen from me is... Hi, I'm Trevor, branch head of the Louis Riel Library and president of the Winnipeg chapter of the Order of the Ancient Dawn. All hail Kalulu. And across the screen from me... Hi, I'm Toby. I'm um, an outreach librarian based out of Millennium Library, and um, I have no plans to disturb the universe uh, at this time. A good book can carry me away from an ever-engined ordinary day, yeah. So keep it down, leave me alone, close the doors and turn off the phone, cause all I And you, dear readers, we wouldn't do this without you. We love hearing your opinions about the books we're reading. They're the magical incantations that bring deeper meaning to our discussions. You can find our email address and all of our social media outlets by going to wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca and scrolling to the bottom of the page. If you hang around till the end of the episode, you can enjoy our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. In a moment, Trevor will give us a summary of the book, but first, Toby will tell us a bit about the author. Okay, um, Matt Ruff. Um, he's not a super famous guy. His Wikipedia page is quite short. He has less than 5,000 followers on Twitter. He seems to me to be a guy who's not very interested in the spotlight. Because he is most well known as the author of the book that became the TV show Lovecraft Country, most of the press he has received is about the book and the TV series. So his bio is really entangled with that of his most well known book, even though he has written six other novels. So he was born on September 8th, 1965, in New York City. His father was a minister, and his mother was the daughter of missionaries and born in Brazil. The family's house was often full of South American relatives, both Lutherans and Mormons, who loved to argue about this upbringing. He says, The upshot of all this is that I learned at an early age that I'd be spending my time on this planet surrounded by people who didn't see eye to eye with me or with each other, and that there was value in learning to understand other perspectives. And my writing reflects this. My novels are all over the place in terms of genre and subject matter, but they often involve some sort of culture clash, and most of my protagonists come from different backgrounds and have different beliefs and worldviews than I do. So Ruff's bio on his website says that he decided he wanted to be a writer at age five, but elsewhere he says, the truth is I don't recall ever making the decision. I'm just one of those people who came wired from the factory knowing what they wanted to do with their lives. Which must be nice. Um, <laughs> he went to Cornell University, and his first novel, Fool on the Hill, was a comic fantasy and written as his senior thesis in Honors English. His second book, Sewer, Gas, and Electric, the Public Works Trilogy, is a cyberpunk adventure. His third novel, A Horror Romance, set this house in order, won a lot of awards, and helped him secure a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. His fourth novel, Bad Monkeys, a psychological thriller, also won a lot of awards and is being developed as a film. As you may have noticed, Ruff does not stick to one genre. Um, 2012's The Mirage is a thriller, Lovecraft Country um, from 2016 is a dark fantasy horror, and his latest, 88 Names, has been called part cyber thriller, part twisted romantic comedy. He says that one of his strongest early influences was Stephen King, who himself was never shy about mixing and mashing genres. Um, so let's talk a bit about Lovecraft Country. Ruff often talks about what he calls kind of the er moment for Lovecraft Country in interviews. So at Cornell, he liked to take long walks in the farmland surrounding campus. And one day after a walk, he stopped by to chat with a friend of his who's black. And he told this friend what he'd been doing and suggested that the friend might enjoy it too. And the friend kind of laughed and said something like, yeah, that sounds like fun, but I can't just go walking around in white farm country. And Ruff was taken aback and was like, what? This isn't the Deep South. This is New York State. Um, but then he started to think about the other people he'd see hiking, you know, usually white people with big dogs, with gun racks. And he realized that if he was black, these walks might have gone very differently. 
So Lovecraft Country was born out of that moment, and it was actually initially pitched as a TV series. His idea was a show similar to The X-Files, with a recurring cast of characters having weekly paranormal adventures. But instead of white FBI agents, it would be a black family in the 1950s. Um, so Ruff says... The idea was to combine these weekly paranormal terrors with the more mundane horrors of life in the U.S. at a time when segregation was still legal. Which is the bigger threat, the monster under the bed or the white policeman pulling you over? So while his initial pitch was passed on, the idea stayed with him and he made it into a book, which became an immediate sensation, piqued the interest of Hollywood, and was adapted as a TV series. So it did end up as a TV series as he initially <laughs> envisioned it. There has been a lot of discussion, of course, about how Ruff, as a white person, wrote this book with black protagonists. Um, of this, he says, I realize that the issue of white authors writing from black perspectives is a particularly fraught one right now. But to me, what I was doing in Lovecraft Country is a natural extension of what I've always done. Use the power of fiction to understand other ways of looking at and living in the world. I wouldn't say I was comfortable doing this. It's always good to be a little nervous so I don't get lazy, but I was reasonably confident that I could do justice to the characters or that if I couldn't, I'd figure that out before I embarrassed myself publicly. Ruff is married to a researcher and rare book expert, and he lives in Seattle. Huh. So that is Matt Ruff. Very interesting. So now, what's this Lovecraft country all about? Doomsday cults, haunted houses, magical books, portals to other galaxies magic potions, time travel, and cursed dolls. What do all these things have in common, aside from being in Dennis's browser history? <laughs> <laughs> well, each of them play a crucial role in this month's read, Lovecraft Country. As Toby said, it was originally conceived as a television series, so each chapter almost acts like a standalone short story or a TV episode that focuses on a different character and is sort of based on one of the horror weird tales tropes I mentioned at the top. I say they almost act like standalone stories because the main characters are connected to one another through either family or friendship, and a book-length story arc soon becomes clear as you move through the stories. At the heart of the novel is Atticus Turner, a young black man and recent Korean War veteran, who learns he has a special connection to a wealthy white New England family that dates back to slavery. The novel takes place in the 1950s, and the horrors of the Jim Crow South impact Atticus and his friends and family in every chapter of the book. Atticus, along with his uncle George, is a voracious reader of science fiction, fantasy, and horror stories of the era, despite these genres being the almost exclusive domain of white writers, including the often racist and xenophobic H.P. Lovecraft. Throughout the novel, we get to learn more about Atticus's family history, along with his uncle George, his aunt Hippolyta, cousin Horace, father Montrose, and childhood friend Letitia and her sister Ruby. The various storylines introduced in each chapter all come together towards the end of the book, and just like a TV show looking for a second season, Lovecraft Country is set up for a potential sequel. So, how did you guys find it? If the genre of horror is creating a feeling of unease and dread, then I had a feeling of unease and dread throughout the book, but I'm not sure if it was from the content or from the context of what has already been mentioned, that a white writer is writing black characters. And, and that tension stayed with me throughout. And I feel very conflicted about, about that. As a story as itself, I enjoyed it. I had no idea going into it that it would be sort of episodic like that. I, I was building up. I thought the whole, what was happening in the first chapter with the, with the journey to New England and everything, I thought that was going to be spread out over the whole book. And then when it kind of reached a very quick kind of climax in that first chapter with the with the cult i was like oh what, what what's I, I didn't expect this this is almost like dr reno dying in the first 60 pages of uh love in the time of cholera so as soon as i, my, I adjusted my brain and my expectations to that and that each one was sort of a standalone story i i, I got into it and and i thought uh matt ruff did a a good job stylistically of, of making each chapter feel slightly different. Like one of those weird tales, comic books that we've probably, you know, read as kids growing up about, about things that don't make a whole lot of sense, but you kind of go with it. 
Yeah, I came into this book a little wary. This is very much out of my comfort zone in in terms of genre. Um, I'm not a person who likes to be scared. I don't watch scary movies. I don't like even, there's this like game my kid likes to play where it's basically hide and seek in the dark and I don't want to play it. Like I don't, I just don't like being scared. And so I was wary, but I... I didn't find this book that scary, and I think there were several things, several reasons. I think a big one was often the characters are in these terrifying situations, but they're not scared. And as a reader, I'm basing my emotions on the characters' emotions, and like if Letitia isn't terrified living in this haunted house, like, you know, I'm not terrified of this haunted house. So that's a reason I didn't find it very scary. And then I also, I mean, with this, a horror book, it's only going to be as scary as your imagination makes it out to be. And so I could, in my own head, picture whatever I want. And so I guess I just sort of distanced myself from anything that would that would really like scare me too much. I originally read this book about five years ago, so I guess around the time it was published. I really enjoyed it. You know, when you're rereading a book, you're always wondering, oh, is it going to be the same this time? We've had that experience with other books where sometimes the reread isn't the same, but I have to say I still enjoy it quite a lot. And part of it, like, it's kind of a horror novel, but it's more like it's, I won't say a tribute to horror novels, but like, uh, or a pastiche of horror you know, it's got a lot of elements of, like you say, the weird tales and the horror themes and uh, things turned on its ear a little bit because the characters aren't the ones that are traditionally in the role that uh, Atticus and his family are. And I found uh, find also that it had a lot of humor to it, partly in the relationships in the family, partly in, I don't know, just some of the stuff seems kind of ridiculous and scary in uh, Kind of like a Goosebumps novel, you know, like when uh, Horace gets that uh, sign massaged into his scalp and then he has that uh, the devil doll chasing him around. Uh, you know, it's it's like watching Child's Play, uh, the horror movie or something like that, where there's just some ludicrous element, elements to go along with the scary element. So the mixture of all that stuff, I really enjoyed both times that I've read it so far. Yeah, you see, I found that horse story the scariest. Um, yeah. <laughs> because one, Horace is scared. You know, he's in this situation that is terrifying and he's, he's afraid. And I don't know, something about like inanimate objects coming to life and particularly dolls. Like it's, it's very unsettling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also kind of silly because there's a doll and you're afraid of the doll. I've often found with horror, your mindset when you are watching or reading it is really, really important. When I was younger, just out of high school, uh, there was a weekend where I couldn't hang out with my friends because they'd all gone away. So I was up and my family had all gone away. So I was alone in the house. Our TV set was in the corner of the basement. I had most of the lights off and it was around midnight and uh, Night of the Living Dead came on. I couldn't watch more than like 20 minutes of it before I had to turn it off and go upstairs and turn all the lights on. It just freaked me out. Several months later, I was together with a group of friends. We were uh, all hanging out together at one of their places, uh, all having a lot of fun. And the movie came on TV again. But this time, everyone was laughing. They were making fun of all the little silly things that come along with horror. And all of a sudden, it wasn't scary at all. It was kind of a kind of a silly movie for, in that point. But when I was alone in the basement with most of the lights off, it was scary. I think it's important, too, to distinguish between horror novels and horror movies because they are in my opinion very different experiences with horror movies they they can rely on the cheap jump scares and they can uh, be as graphic as anything like toby said you in the books you can you can imagine what you want even if the, the description is horrible your your brain can kind of do a little bit of even like unconscious editing so that what you're reading is not uh, like a visual image that's seared into your brain I, I like I like both. I've read Stephen King since yeah, like junior high. I I, I watch I watch horror movies, uh, different experiences. Like for me, it's like uh, the horror movie is almost like you get kind of um almost like a like a rush and then kind of a release at the end. It's sort of like a very weird kind of there's like a catharsis that goes on with horror novels. For me, it's more like 
putting myself in the shoes of the characters and wondering how I would react and see how they react in these ridiculous, sometimes unbelievable, but often terrifying and unusual uh, situations. And uh, I still remember reading Stephen King's The Stand. And there, there's a scene in that there's a character called the Trash Can Man. And the scene is so descriptive and just, you know... Uh, FYI, the stand is about a, a super flu that kills 99.4% of the world's population. <laughs> so kind of like not as bad as COVID. I mean, worse than COVID. COVID's not as bad. What am I talking about? But but the idea is that the, there's large swaths of, of areas that are just uninhabited. And there's this, a huge bank of like there's an oil refinery. And this guy's a guy's a pyro. So his idea of, of blowing up this oil refinery and saying, if I, and just the detail. And I mean, I'm not, I, I, I'm not an arsonist. I want, but I, I want to go on the record, but there's something about reading that passage from the stand. When I read it the first time, I just felt like full on adrenaline, like, Oh no, he's not going to do this. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, he is. And then I was right along with that. And I feel horror has that way of drawing you in maybe more so than other genres. But I like what Toby said too, about how, when the characters aren't scared, then then we weren't scared. And that was something else I thought the book did really well was even though each chapter was a different type of weird tale, it always kind of turned the genre on its ear. Like, for example, a lot of times with the haunted house story, people are either driven insane or they, they commit suicide or they leave. But Letitia, she befriended the ghost uh, in a way <laughs> and kind of negotiated like she was so tough she was able to almost tame the ghost and and they had sort of a two-way relationship where the ghost was able to provide information to her that was helpful and so i thought yeah there's very interesting things uh, in the book yeah speaking of leticia and the haunted house i also really enjoyed the scene where the you know the kids were breaking in to try to cause damage and drive them away and the ghost was like not in my house you know like where the enemy of my enemy becomes my friend i guess i wonder if I, well, I'm sure it was. It was purposeful on Ruff's part to make perhaps the supernatural or those elements of the horror less scary than just like the white people who are coming to kill the black people for no reason, just for the reason that their skin is a different color. Particularly, I think about that first story where... Again, I didn't find the cults or, you know, Mont Rose being chained up in the basement particularly scary, but that moment in the diner, there was a lot of tension there where, you know, you're not quite sure what's going to happen. Are they going to get away? Um, or in the, in the forest when the police take them into the forest and you're sure they're going to get shot. Those moments were much more terrifying than the paranormal moments. That was one of the questions we asked on our social media. This book combined realistic horror with supernatural horror and which do you find scarier and i agree with you toby like the to me the horror that could happen to me or has happened to other people that is scarier than something that i don't believe can happen just because maybe it will maybe someday i'll be in that situation where someone has taken me off into the woods and is holding me at gunpoint and i hope that never happens but it could and that always seems to me uh, scarier than, you know, that the Shoggoth will appear. Even though when it's late at night and I am alone in a basement and the lights are all off, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll jump a little at a shadow, you know. Trevor, how do you feel about the realistic versus supernatural horror? I feel like the most powerful horror is a combination of both. Something that starts grounded in reality that you can relate to. Often Stephen King yeah, it does this. It's a small town. We can relate to it. Or it's a, it's a, a relationship. It's a marriage. And then slowly things are introduced that are horrific and supernatural. But, but because it's grounded in reality, you're willing to go along for the ride. But I, I agree with both of you that I think in, in this book, the real life horrors of the racism of America in the 1950s. And that's when the characters that we've come to care about those are the terrifying parts. The uh, the rest of it was just kind of window dressing or or almost kind of fun, like a like almost like a Scooby Doo scenario where there's ghosts and things. But it's not that scary. But that opening scene of the novel where Atticus is driving back to Chicago and he's pulled over by the state trooper, I thought that was extremely well written. Again, like I used Stephen King as as the bar, and I thought that scene could have been written by Stephen King in terms of right away you just know like 
I, I was tense. I was tense throughout that scene until it was resolved. And then I didn't feel good about it. I was like, no, like this is wrong. Everything about this is wrong. And then that was even before the first supernatural thing happened. So, I mean, I think there's a reason why our uh, true crime section of the library is always popular always the books are being checked out we have to withdraw them because they're dog-eared and we are uh, always ordering new copies of of classics and getting new ones i think there is something about real horrors that people find compelling arguably much scarier than ghosts and vampires that's one thing i noticed about the conclusion of the book too when they're uh you know they're sending caleb braithwaite on his way and he's like all of these other people are going to be coming after you. Like, do you realize you're never going to have a moment's peace? Like, you'll always have someone coming after you. And they all start laughing <laughs> because it's like, yeah, that that's that's what we're already experiencing. That's our life. That's what it is in this country for us. You know, you can't scare us with that threat because that threat has always been with us. And I thought that was a, an interesting way to to express that. Did you um, have favorite stories from the collection? I think my my personal favorite of all of them was the fourth chapter when Hecalita opens the portal to that uh, other dimension and goes through. Just because it was to me, it was so unexpected. I find almost those kinds of stories are almost the, the scariest. Like when I think back to say someone like Ray Bradbury, I find his stories that deal with Mars are the most isolating and kind of terrifying in a way. And this reminded me very much like a Ray Bradbury story. I think just as a whole, as, as a as a self-contained chapter, that one was by far my favorite. And it also creeped me out because that alien thing, like at the end, like, what, what was that? Was that? Did she have? Did she have sex with the alien? And was that her baby? Like, like what? Are we supposed to, like? Is that what? We're, like what? Like, like Ida? Mm-hmm. You're talking about? Yeah, Ida. Because okay. she's like, this is this is my child no. or whatever. What happened? Like that's that's no. how I read it. No, no, no. No, no tell me what happened. No, that, that that was like an an animal from that world. Yeah, uh, that, that was like got... an egg or or something like that that she gave to Hippolyta. Uh, that, that that what they call it, uh, Skilla. Yeah, I think she was trying to kill Hippolyta with it. Yeah. Yeah. What? yeah. I gotta go. Yeah, yeah she she wanted again. to ensure. She wanted to ensure Hippolyta wouldn't reveal where she was. So she gave her that, uh, like, egg of that monster thing so that when she opened it on the other side, it would kill her and then no one would know where she was. You see, I didn't get that at all. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was way darker that Ida was having sex with that thing on the beach and then produced no. this egg and then no. she's, she wanted the thing to live. Now, obviously, yeah, that's probably you need not to, what happened. To write write so, your own fan fiction yeah. where that happens, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, just just wait for that. <laughs> yeah, this this kind of reminds me, you know, there's that thing about misheard lyrics, you know, uh, like excuse <laughs> excuse me while I kiss this guy <laughs> right. instead of kiss the sky. Uh, you've just created a, your own fan fiction. Yeah. Just uh, so Matt Ruff, if you're listening, call me if there is a season two <laughs> of. Uh, Lovecraft Country, I have ideas. Ida in the Ida. egg. <laughs> Ida in the egg, yeah. Well, um, it's interesting. Yeah. That was my favorite story, too, the Hippolyta one. Um, because of the alien sex, Yeah, obviously. yeah, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't know I, it was happening, but I, I liked it. Um, I, I thought that story really was um, was quite different from the whole collection. Like, it, it was more sci-fi than any of the other stories. I didn't find it very scary. I, d- I don't think I had that same experience that you did, Trevor. But I thought, like, that there were just some interesting details. I thought, like, the world of the planet was very interesting, how she got there. I loved that little microwave that they put a number into mm. and out would pop, you know, a strange food like i i i really yeah i like that chapter a lot i did too and one of the things in this book is that uh matt ruff put in a lot of historical references to racism and how it impacted people in the story and the thing that stuck out with me in that story was how hippolyta could have and should have been an astronomer and would likely have been a good one. But she never had that opportunity for a variety of reasons, but all of them stem back to the fact that she was a black woman. Whenever she had the opportunity to go to an observatory or something like that, she knew her stuff. She knew all of this stuff that the uh, other people at the observatory knew. She could have been their peer. 
but wasn't given the opportunity. It reminded me of a line that I had read somewhere, and I, I forget. I think it was attributed to Albert Einstein at one point, but uh, you know how everything gets attributed to Einstein. Uh, it was something like, who knows how many geniuses have been out there who could have changed the world, but they were working in a field instead all their lives. It, it's one of those things that highlights how any society that cuts off a significant portion of itself from contributing productively really limits itself. If you look at the world right now, any society where women don't have a significant say and, and can't work in the workforce, economically, they never do terribly well. You don't want to cut off half your population. And if you're cutting off any group, like all black people during times of slavery and institutionalized and really obvious racism, you remove them from the pool of people who can contribute to our lives. And that doesn't help us really as a as a planet, as a people. We're limited by that. And Hippolyta is an example of that. She could have been that person who discovered a new star or uh, came up with a new theory about interstellar something or other. I'm not an astronomer, so I can't even guess at it accurately. I really liked her character, too. I liked all of the characters in the book pretty much. Even the villains. I thought Caleb Braithwaite was a great villain. He's one of those seductive villains who's like, seems like he's almost a nice guy, you know, relative to all these other people. He's pretty nice, you know, he's helping you out while he's manipulating you and getting his own way and setting things up. And, you know, maybe you'll get burned at the end of it. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of give and take with the villains and the good guys, you know, like the black characters are often helping the Braithwaites, the Braithwaites are often helping the black characters. It's not clear, sort of. He's not like a, you know, super evil, like, archetypal bad guy. There is some goodness. Well, I don't know. Is there goodness to him? I'm not sure. It's, that's the thing about him, though, right? Like, on the surface level, he seems like a pretty good guy. He helps out the Turner family and their friends. When he gets stuff from them, he is kind of paying them something or giving them something back, like you say. But at the same time, every interaction he has with them, there's a cost for them. They're, they have to do something for him. They have to provide something, and he doesn't really give them a choice. He presents it as a choice, but there's always a consequence. And I like that conversation between Montrose and Caleb when uh, Montrose is drawing out what the threat is. And at the end, when uh, you know he's finally gotten everything that he can from Caleb, he's like, yeah, I knew there'd be a threat in there somewhere. <laughs> He's definitely a complex character and very interesting and not, like you say, your one-dimensional uh, mustache-twirling villain. Every every time he helps, though, he always has ulterior motives. It's every act that seems like uh, an act of grace is also ultimately selfish. You know, the, the whole making sure that Letitia and Ruby get the house seemed like a very generous thing behind the scenes, but it was because he wanted the access to the Winthrop house and uh, the ghost and the connection. And then also, yeah. you know, the, he paid off the debt, which I thought that was a, a great sort of ending in the chapter where with uh, Abdullah's book. He thought that then that meant, you know, cash, uh, payout should be it and it kind of was an interesting idea that's almost like uh whenever there's like you know the the, the oppressor versus the oppressed it's like okay we'll we'll just just pay we'll just pay it off and, and we're done we're good here now right we we paid this amount uh, everything's forgiven and uh they're like what no i mean that's great we're we're all we're all good with that but that does not right the the wrongs of the last you know 500 years or whatever yeah no he's he was an interesting guy and i like that he didn't he didn't spoilers he didn't get killed killed in the end, <laughs> uh, that he just was kind of greatly reduced in his power and is you know still around. I, I like that part of it. That was interesting, too, is that his punishment at the end was just not being as powerful as before. He had to give up some power. He could still live. He could do all his stuff. He still had money. You know, he... He'd be fine. He'd do doing better than most of the population of North America. He's got plenty of resources. He just doesn't have as much power anymore. And that was a really hard thing for Caleb to accept. I mean, um, besides the elder Braithwaites, uh, no one was really killed in this book, which is maybe unusual for horror. I mean, I like I said, I'm not a, I don't partake in the genre, but. Um, it's not a book where people die. Yeah, That's true. I, I hadn't actually thought about that before, but uh, normally in a horror book, uh, at least a few people are going to die. 
Um, Trevor, I'd like to go back to what you were saying at the beginning about the unease you felt uh, reading the book because it was written by a white man. Yes, definitely. And thank you yeah, for bringing it up again, because the idea of cultural appropriation is something that we've seen in, in Canada. Uh, and it's not a new thing. I, I think the first, I mean, I became aware of it was back in the, the eighties with an, uh, Canadian writer, W.P. Kinsella, who it's a great, let me just say, like, I love his writing. He wrote a bunch of baseball books, one of which was turned into Field of Dreams, but he also wrote a series of stories taking place on, uh, Indian reservation in Northern Alberta. And all the characters, most of the characters are indigenous and W.P. Kinsella is a white man. And that became quite problematic. Well, at a certain point in the 80s, there was there was um, a, a debate. That was the first time I was aware of the debate that came up of a cultural appropriation. There may be times that happened before that. And what's interesting is it, it comes up again and again. Uh, recently, Joseph Boyden and whether he claiming to be from certain indigenous groups and they do not have a record or do they recognize that. And our own... Um, friend of the podcast, Jordan Wheeler, had written an opinion piece around the time with Joseph Boyd, and, and he he mentions the W.P. Kinsella controversy, and and his take on it was that, you know, we can't stop people from writing what they're going to write. People are going to write, but, but what he sees is that it just means that writers who are from uh, minority groups just need to write better stories and need to have those stories published and, and be out there for people to read as an alternative to these stories. And so you seen it as a much bigger, like a systemic problem that these stories can exist. And, and it made me think a while back, there was a bit of a controversy about, do you remember Dr. Seuss and a bunch of his titles were going to no longer be published because of the characterization of certain groups in them. And we had discussion in the library, like do we, you know, censorship versus access. And I really liked what our colleague uh, Kim Perry said, uh, branch head at the St. John's Library. She said, you know, instead of censoring, let's just highlight and lift up other books. Let's do displays of other books that are better and, and showcase what uh, we have to offer it. We don't, it doesn't have to be a matter of not having these other books, but just making a point. And I don't know if, you know, it's a couple of weeks ago, she wrote a really great reader salon post called the diversity of horror. And I thought it tied really nicely into our topic this month, because what it is, is it's a list of books by authors of diverse backgrounds. And maybe we'll put a link to that up in our show notes. But for example, the first one on her list is called Tattoo Me, and it's uh, an anthology of uh, horror stories, but from people from the Arctic all around the world, and and just as an example. So it's a great read if you if you're interested in in horror, but feeling a little like oh another white guy writing horror. Her her blog post is great, and uh, I uh, asked her if I could mention it, and she said I could. So <laughs> yay to Kim. So did you find this book problematic in any of those ways? I think just having the knowledge that a white person was writing these characters to me was the thing that was kind of like a little cloud hanging over me while I was reading it. And if I didn't know the author was white, the, the story itself, I, I didn't have a problem with. It was just the, the idea that this is another story that, that it was bothering me throughout the whole, the whole read. But there wasn't anything actually in the text of the story that I thought was poorly done or, or I thought it was very well done. I really enjoyed the whole section about Uncle George and his travel agency that was uh, geared towards black travelers and uh, about areas that were safe and gas stations and hotels that were uh, friendly. And, uh, and is that sort of like a, a, a structure to, to kind of tell some of the stories that they were sent out on research into these different areas. It's a great kind of hook for continuing stories too. I felt kind of like, Oh, I want to like this book more. And the only reason I'm, I'm, I'm holding back is because of that issue of the uh, a white author writing these black characters, which, again, I mean, I love the W.P. Kinsella stories. I still read them, but they probably, going back to visit them now, are probably very problematic. At the time, I just thought they were great, uh, funny stories, and the, and the characters were, you know, uh, enjoyable. And he, he's such a good writer. I, you know, I, it's uh, difficult. It is. I mean, one of the things about fiction about writing is that you're often writing characters that are not you. I mean, I know the traditional advice for an author is write what you know, 
but authors also often write things that they can't possibly know, including getting inside characters' heads that are different from them. And generally, I approve of the idea of getting into other people's heads and trying to understand them from their own position. I think that's one of the great things about fiction is that you read these different ideas. The question of cultural appropriation is one that I have always found difficult on that level and I thought this book was very respectful. Like, it brings up a lot of history that, uh, for instance, I wasn't really aware of. I didn't know that something like the Safe Negro Travel Guide existed, and it did in the form of the Green Book, which uh, I think since has had a movie made about it, just focusing on that. This book also brought up the Tulsa riots and a number of other issues, and I thought it did that very well. But also these issues are brought up in books by authors of color, so... Yeah, I, I like the story. I think it's still worth reading, but you can also find books by authors from the community uh, that represent these things as well. Yeah, I agree. I think he did do a, a very good job of writing these black characters. I mean, I think when we're talking about appropriation, like in some of the examples you gave Trevor, I mean, Boyden was pretending to be someone he was not. That was part that was the one of the big issues or same with um oh what was the other oh the the seuss i mean that's just downright racist <laughs> rough is not is not telling us he's black he's not telling us you know he has any any of this culture and it's okay for him to to write this way he's he's doing it and he, i think he's doing it respectfully one thing I did notice was kind of the magical Negro trope a bit in here, which I was wondering if Ruff is maybe trying to subvert this stock character a little bit, but the magical Negroes in this book, they do what they always do. You know, they come to the aid of, of white protagonists. And so I'm not quite sure what his intention was with that, if it was even a conscious thing that he was doing, but that was the only thing that kind of stood out for me there. I think he did actually explicitly kind of bring that one out, right? Like at one point, and I'm trying to remember now if it was in the book or like I watched the first episode of the TV series, so I'm not sure if it was brought up there or in the book. But at one point, one of the characters does say, oh, you want me to be your magical Negro? Uh, explicitly calling out that trope. Yes, I, I remember that scene. I think it was in the first chapter between Caleb and uh, Atticus when he was explaining how he, they needed, as a you know, spoilers again, a blood relative that, for the rituals. And I think that's when he he actually used that term, which I thought yeah. was interesting because I mean it is a term that you hear used describing culture, but is it a term that? Well, I'm just maybe maybe so because Atticus was such a fan of pulp, a genre that that he probably was aware that this was a almost like a cliche that would come up again and again. Uh, I was just thinking, like, would he know to use that term? But but definitely Matt Ruff did. I, th I think it was pretty explicit that he was aware that this was a thing and that he was calling Caleb out for it for treating him like that. And one of the things about the book is that. While they are made to serve Caleb's interests for the bulk of the book, at the end of it, they subvert his intentions by not being what he expects them to be. You know, Caleb talked a lot in the book about how his opponents underestimated him. And then in the end, when he lost out and he got uh, reduced in power and such, he was, he was like, well, wh where did I go wrong? What mistake did I make? And the mistake he made was he underestimated Atticus and his family and his friends. Like, he underestimated all of them and assumed he was smart enough to control and manipulate everybody. So he lost out because that was his expectation there. So I thought that part was intentionally addressed, and I thought it went pretty well. Come to think of it, though, I don't know if the term magical Negro would have been a thing in the 50s. I'm not sure. I remember there was a movie with Will Smith where he was a, a caddy on a golf course. And I think after that, I read some criticism about the movie, and that was one of the terms that came up, and that was the first time I was aware of it. But I think it goes back to like also talking about like Uncle Remus in the Disney movies uh, as a character that was treated that way. Uh, so I don't know how far back that goes. Well, even more recently, like in Stephen King's The Green Mile, there's a, a character, mm -hmm. one of the prisoners, it's, it it's definitely falls into the magical negro trope even though maybe stephen king should have known better but uh you know there it is yeah well stephen king was taking a lot of cocaine at that time so <laughs> yeah. was, was he really so say what 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh oh yeah yeah. He, he went through this whole period of uh, very very heavy cocaine. He's been very open about it yeah. uh, since then. He was so wasted. He doesn't even remember writing Cujo. He said that he said there's that book. He said yeah, it sounds like something I would write, but he has no memory of it. So huh, I had no idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we kind of mentioned the TV series too. Uh, did you guys have you guys had a chance to watch any of it? I have not. I watched the first episode. I was, I'm wary because like I've mentioned, I don't like being scared. I'm always disappointed when I watch the movie or TV show after reading the book. And this was the same situation. It was very interesting how they kind of like changed the narrative and combined some things and just made other things totally different. I don't know if I'm going to continue to watch it mostly because I'm worried about it being too scary. Um, hmm. but it was, it was okay, I guess. <laughs> I found first of off the filming on this thing is gorgeous. Like they really spent money on the budget to make this good. Uh, and before I watched it, like one of the things I learned about it was Jordan Peele was involved and, uh, I'm a big Jordan Peele fan. You know, his key and Peele comedy series with uh, Keegan Michael Key was really good. And, uh, when he made his directorial debut with Get Out, I thought that was an amazing horror film. And so, you know, that was kind of exciting. Then I heard J.J. Abrams was attached, and that's kind of like, eh, that can go either way. But then I found out they had cast Michael K. Williams as Montrose. And in my head, like when I first was reading the book, I was imagining like Samuel L. Jackson as that kind of, you know, cantankerous, uh, very strong willed character. Cause I, I've seen him in that role a lot. But then I, Michael K. Williams, uh, he's, uh, played Omar in The Wire. R.I.P. Uh, Michael K. Williams. I know it's such a loss because, uh, I've seen him in a few things and he is like magnetic. He's, uh, just this amazing actor to watch. Unfortunately, he doesn't appear in the first episode, or at least I didn't notice him in it, uh, but uh, I might watch it just to see him perform because <laughs> he is always worth watching. Oh, so you haven't actually seen it, Dennis? I, I saw the first episode. Oh, just the first one. Okay. Yeah, but Montrose doesn't appear in the first episode, so uh, I didn't get to see Michael K. Williams do his thing. But I might watch more of it just to see that. Yeah, like there uh, were vampires in the first episode. Like it's very it, – it really takes a weird turn. <laughs> yeah, but that's okay, I think. Uh, uh, anyways, I think it, it, it's – I've heard uh, various things about it, mostly positive. Uh, and unfortunately, it appears that there will not be a second season. So, uh, But the first season apparently follows mostly along with the book, but with some changes. Yeah, I was uh, Googling, like, how scary is Lovecraft Country, the TV show, and it seems like there's some pretty terrifying moments in um, later episodes, so FYI. Yeah, what, what you were saying about the characters not being scared, in that first episode, they are definitely scared, <laughs> yes. and you can see it, especially Letitia. The actress does a wonderful job of, of showing Letitia being scared out of her mind, but still doing the brave thing. Worth watching if you enjoy the book, I think. And similar to the book, like that, the moments I found scariest in that first episode were the moments with the white police officers. You know, I found mm. the paranormal stuff almost cartoonish, whereas the real moments, the threats posed by racism and racists were, were much more tense and much more scary. Yeah. Even though I knew what was going to happen, like I knew they'd be fine. I read the book. <laughs> Spoilers for anyone who is scared, the whole family makes it to the end. <laughs> so you can watch it and know that they will be okay. Then we shall move on to our segment called, Can You Tell Me a Book I Would Also Like? I have a bit of a theme this month for my book and my word, but we'll start with my book. So what I liked about Lovecraft Country was the ways it dealt with anti-black racism. And I just felt like there wasn't enough of that. I wanted more. And of course, this book is limited because it's fiction. Um, it's set in the past. Sorry, Toby, did you say you wanted more racism? Well, is that what I, you said? <laughs> I didn't want more. <laughs> well, maybe I, I kind of did because I wanted the characters to deal more with that. And those were the moments I felt actually scared and there was some tension. And that's that's what I enjoyed. And I, I thought it got, gave a lot of food for thought. Um, so, yes, Very more, more <laughs> racism. Thank you. Carry on. <laughs> okay. But yes, like I was saying, this book is limited because it's fiction, it's set in the past, and it's also American, and as we've discussed, it's written by a white dude. Um, so I wanted to recommend a book that's nonfiction, contemporary, Canadian, 
and written by a black dude, and that's um, The Skin We're In, A Year of Black Resistance and Power by Desmond Cole. It was total kismet that I read this book right before I read Lovecraft Country. It's um, It's been on my reading list for a really long time, but I avoided it um, thinking it'd be very academic or very didactic, but it's not at all. It's um, super readable, super engaging. It talks about racism, particularly anti-Black racism in Canada in 2017, Desmond Cole is a journalist, but he's also an activist. And this book is just, it's so inspiring because Cole talks about his activism and the very real ways it affects change in these racist systems. And I just, I i was blown away by this book. I think it should be required reading for all Canadians. Um, my husband is reading it and enjoying it right now. Yeah, I wish, I wish I'd read it sooner. The skin we're in, a year of black resistance and power. Skin we're in, yes. Nice. Well, in Lovecraft Country, as I mentioned before, one of the things about Atticus and his uncle is that they were conflicted by reading stories by H.P. Lovecraft and other authors of that era because although they loved the stories, they were also the the man and also through his, his writings uh, came through was obviously very racist particularly towards black people, but uh, immigrants and uh, just generally xenophobic. And so with that in mind, the book that I'm suggesting for this month is called The Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Laval. Now, Victor Laval may be a familiar voice to longtime listeners because we read his book, The Changeling, back in September 2019. And uh, Victor Laval, just like Atticus Turner, when he was a kid growing up in Queens, black neighborhood, read science fiction, fantasy, horror, you name it, including H.P. Lovecraft. And he didn't realize till he was much older that there are so many problems with H.P. Lovecraft that we could spend another whole episode talking about. And so what he did, which was a really interesting idea, is he took one of maybe H.P. Lovecraft's more notorious short stories called The Horror at Red Hook, which basically describes this neighborhood in Brooklyn, Red Hook, which is lots of immigrants and things. And the way that H.P. Uh, Lovecraft describes it is like they're like of the devil, and a portal to hell actually opens in this neighborhood. And it's probably one of the, the worst slash best examples of H.P. Lovecraft's uh, racist ideas put into his stories. And so what Victor Lavelle does is he takes that story and he retells the plot of it, but from a, a young black protagonist. So he inserts a character called Ch- a Charles Thomas Tester, who's kind of a blues musician from Harlem, kind of a hustler. And he gets invited to play at this lavish party of this guy, Robert Suddam, who is actually a character in the original story, Horror at Red Hook. And so you, it's a very interesting, well done story that kind of addresses a lot of the racism. It kind of takes elements of the original story and, and remixes them. And in fact, the dedication to it, yeah, he writes, for H.P. Lovecraft, with all my conflicted feelings. And so, uh, I recommend The Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Lavelle. That book was on the short list of ones I was going to recommend too. But what I'm going to put forward for a book you might also like, uh, with some conflicted feelings is the complete works of H.P. Lovecraft. It's an ebook that you can get online from archive.org, which collects every story and novella and novel that H.P. Uh, Lovecraft wrote as an adult during his lifetime. I'm conflicted, of course, because H.P. Eh, Lovecraft is problematic. He is also like his prose is uh, really good and readable, which I wasn't expecting from uh, horror stories from that time period. Lovecraft kind of created almost his own genre, which is uh, often referred to as cosmic horror. The th- general theme of which is that the universe is full of large, powerful entities and forces, and humanity is a tiny, insignificant speck, helpless and powerless in the face of everything else around us. The universe is large and entirely indifferent to us. And if you are unfortunate enough to get caught in the wake of these more powerful entities or even discover them, it's often enough to destroy your sanity. It's a type of horror and uh, worldview that I've seen expressed in other places as well. But if you like that type of thing, Lovecraft is actually really good at it. Uh, You just have to 
be aware of some of his other tendencies and uh, to see them. So that's the, the conflicted and problematic part. So it's not a full endorsement of or anything, but uh, if you were interested in the idea of Lovecraft based on the story, you might want to see some of the original and it's public domain now. And speaking of Lovecraft's racism, when I was doing some searching for it, um, one of the, you know, Google will suggest a search or suggest a search term. Uh, one of the terms that came up was Lovecraft's cat's name. <laughs> and it turns, uh, there are pictures of a young Lovecraft holding a cute kitty and I love cats. And, uh, well, it turns out the family named it a very racist name. <laughs> If you're wondering how indelibly racism is in Lovecraft and his life, the cat has a name that I won't repeat. Is it a black cat? No, but they still went there with the name, though. Oh, yikes. Yeah. Well, so, it, it, uh, an interesting thing, too, about Lovecraft is that so much of his books deal with the idea of the unknown and the other, and that also... You can see that in his in his personal life, his fear of the unknown, his fear of others, mm -hmm. but in his writing transfers into giant, like multi-eyed tentacled creatures that live in the depths of the earth. Uh, and it, so he, he um, you can definitely <laughs> see that the guy was scared and paranoid and not right in a lot of ways and yeah. uh, expresses it comes out in different ways. But he did create a lot of cool monsters that uh, we still use in role-playing games and such today. And, oh, yeah, you know, totally. He's, Dungeons and Dragons. influence in a lot of places. Even, like, uh, the World of Warcraft video games. Like, you name it. You, you don't have to look very far. You don't have to scratch the surface before there's an H.P. Lovecraft reference. Even South Park. Uh, you know how yeah. uh, Kenny dies every episode, or he did up for a while, and then he appears again, uh, and everyone's like, well, how does that happen? Well, in one episode or a series, they explained that Kenny's parents were part of the uh, of the cult of uh, Cthulhu, and that uh, they did a ritual when Kenny went before he was born, so he has the power to die and return, which, of course, is just like the South Park guys having fun. But, yeah, it's it's pervasive. It is. And now it's time for everyone's favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, wherein our panelists try to bring out the magic of words by discussing a word or phrase that has enchanted us. So I'm continuing my anti-racism theme um, this month, and my word is woke. So woke is, um, it's the past of wake, but in today's parlance, it means um, you someone who is alert to racial or social discrimination and injustice, as in, uh, she is woke. I had thought this word was fairly contemporary, but the term stay woke actually emerged in African American vernacular English in the 1930s. It actually wasn't popularized, though, until um, more recently, 2008, Erica Badu came out with a song in which she says, I stay woke. So that brought the word back. Another thing that sort of brought that word back was the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. The phrase was popularized by Black Lives Matter activists seeking to raise awareness about police shootings of Black Americans. And then it was just really widely used on Twitter. It gained momentum as a mem. Um, it was increasingly used by people to signal their support for Black Lives Matter. And then it was officially added to the Oxford English Dictionary in 2017. I read an interesting article about woke that was saying it's kind of um, heading the same way that political correctness did in the 90s. You know, um, it's becoming a bit of an insult. It can have negative connotations. It can be misused. It's often something that the right throws at the left as as an insult. But since choosing this word. I have noticed it in a lot of things I'm consuming, books and TV shows and podcasts and things. So I feel like we've, we've got a few more years before it uh, goes the way of political correctness. But I thought it was very interesting about how, how these words sort of come up and then lose meaning or change meaning and, and fade away and then something else comes to replace them. So woke. My word this month is very recently came to me. It came to me this morning while I was having breakfast and I was listening to the radio. And the word is Desi, uh, D-E-S-I. So by itself, it just is a word that describes the people, cultures, and products of the Indian subcontinent and the people around the world. It's from the Sanskrit and it means land or country and specifically India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh is the area. Now, Desi itself, that's the word, but the word I want to combine with it is pizza. 
because on the radio this morning, they were talking about around Winnipeg, I'm sure other cities too, in the last year and a half, couple of years, Desi Pizza joints have popped up and it's pizza, but uh, with toppings that are inspired from Indian food and uh, the Indian subcontinent. So for example, toppings might include cauliflower or ginger or raisins, which initially I thought that sounds not for me. But by the end of the interview, I was convinced because the raisins, they're, they're ground up and they're put as part of the sauce. So it gives a bit of sweetness. The cauliflower is roasted. And I've noticed in some pizza places already, you can get things like butter chicken pizza, which I've had. It's delicious. And it's kind of an interesting melding of different cultures, fusion, and uh, also provides a lot more vegetarian options. Because typically, you know, at, at a pizza place, if you look at the specials, it's like meat lovers and then meat and then uh, extra meat, and then pepperoni, uh, and then and then there'll be like the veggie lovers or the vegetarian one. And may, if you're lucky, the Greek one might not be vegetarian. But this gives you a whole bunch of ideas. And so I said to my family this morning, this weekend, we're getting Desi pizza. And so I'm looking forward to it. I don't know from where we're going to get it, but uh, I'm very excited. And you know what? If we can have pineapple on, on pizza, which I am a firm believer of. I don't even know why that's a controversy. Pineapple is delicious. Some people it's like to call it the Hawaiian. not pizza. Oh, oh my gosh, Toby! I didn't know that you were you were the, on the other side of this. Toby, I'm so uh, disappointed. Oh, but uh, you know, so Desi Pizza, and I'm very excited by this new term that I've learned today, which is probably not new to most people, but to me, and that's my nerd word for this month. There's a Desi Pizza and Curry's just like a, a block from where I am right now. Oh my gosh, Dennis! What are you doing here recording this podcast? You, I don't know. You, I've, you, I've never I've never gone in to get pizza, but now I'm interested. Oh, yeah, let's do it. I often try to pick a nerd word that fits the book we're discussing in some way. This month's selection is just something that got pushed into my head involuntarily over the past month. Because this past month, my wife has been following a criminal case in the news, and one of the people involved has the last name Laundry uh, with an IE. Some people who were following the case apparently felt the Laundry family was withholding information, and as a way of expressing their feelings about it, they were leaving empty laundry baskets at the laundry family home. Uh, what I assume they were doing is they were trying to evoke the phrase dirty laundry. And that expression has been stuck in my head as a result. So it's my nerd phrase this month. The expression to air one's dirty laundry in public means to reveal personal matters in public, which should probably be left private. It's often shortened to just dirty laundry, and it's often associated with sensationalist tabloid style journalism. The phrase was first used in English in 1867 and is apparently derived from an old French proverb that translates as, one should wash one's dirty laundry at home. Uh, there's a pretty catchy Don Henley song from the early 80s called Dirty Laundry, which is about sensationalist tabloid journalism, and the song has been stuck in my head too. It was apparently at least partially inspired by some of Henley's own dirty laundry getting attention in the news. If you search for the song on YouTube, there's a parody video produced by Global News in Toronto back in 1985 where the station's news crew lip-syncs along to the song. Considering that the song is critical of their profession, I found it weird to watch it. Uh, I have to assume they weren't too worried about having their own dirty laundry aired in public. So, dirty laundry. Good reminder. You know how it is. It's just a word keeps getting thrown at you all month for some reason. It's just, just one of those months. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have this month. Thank you so much for joining us, dear readers. For next month, we're reading The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot. This narrative nonfiction book looks at the life and legacy of Henrietta Lacks, a poor southern tobacco farmer who worked the same land as her enslaved ancestors, yet her cells, taken without her knowledge, became one of the most important tools in medicine. Her cells were vital for creating the polio vaccine, investigating cancer, and much more, yet she is mostly unknown, buried in an unmarked grave. This tale of scientific discovery and human consequences is one we've been looking forward to discussing for a while now, so we hope you'll join us next month to do just that. Have an idea about what we should read next? Let us know. You can find all our contact info at the bottom of the page at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. You can also find all our past episodes and discussion questions there, too. If you haven't already, subscribe to Time to Read on your favorite podcasting service, and maybe leave us a review. Tell your book-loving friends about us, too. And until next time, make sure you find Time, time to, to Read. read.
which automatically makes us twice as clever. I just realized I didn't think of a clever intro for today's episode. We, we have okay, Des, this time when you say your name, you, you throw it to me first and then go to Toby after, because I think my funny opening would be funnier if I say it and I just say, and across the screen for me, like as if it's no big deal. Okay, we'll do that. <laughs> Always feel free to make special requests like that if you've got something in mind. It just came to me now that might be funnier if I just, if it's that way, but I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's not funny at all, so we'll see. Oh, boy. That's the way I always feel about any joke I make. <laughs>